Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. It is June the 10th, 2024. Let's talk about Alexander Usyk. Let's talk about the future of the heavyweight division. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me just say, many of you are going to disagree with this video, right? I'm just telling you my view on things. Uh, sometimes my view doesn't track the public narrative, doesn't track what the public thinks is happening, and that's okay. Again, the opinion you should follow should be your own. I'm just sharing mine. Feel free in the comment section of this video to tell us your view, um, where you disagree with me. If you want to take the conversation in a different direction, please feel free to do so. Now, let's ask the question. What happens to the heavyweight title? Should Usyk beat Tyson Fury in the rematch? And keep in mind, Usyk right now is a sizable favorite. I made a video yesterday where I talked about Fury being a plus 150 underdog. Believe it or not, the line has moved even further in the last 24 hours. I'm seeing Fury now uh, closing in on a plus 160. Understand, the market right now is giving Tyson Fury less than a 40% chance of winning the rematch. Let me make a few more points here, and it's a perception point here. It's the kind of stuff I believe in. You know, it is hard to beat a new favorite, right? Understand, and I know it just sounds obvious, but it's not. We favor favorites. Usyk, same fighter is now viewed differently, even though the margin of the first fight was razor close on the judges' scorecards. We view it differently. Usyk won the match. Let me go one step further. I personally believe no one roots for Goliath. In other words, I'm expecting a Pat Mahomes, great player, three-time Super Bowl MVP, Still in his 20s. I'm expecting a Pat Mahomes to have a hard time winning another MVP, at least for the next couple years, just because we're tired of him. Right? But Usyk has an advantage. Because Usyk is from the Ukraine and has had to fight his big fights on the road, Right? He fights Maris Bredis in Lafia, the other guy's backyard. He fights Gassiev in Moscow, the other guy's backyard. He fights Tony Bellew in the UK, the other guy's backyard. He fights Anthony Joshua, first fight in the UK, the other guy's backyard. He fights Glowacki in Poland the other guy's backyard. Because Usyk is not from some first world country, right? The U.S., the U.K., right? Because he is from the Ukraine and because he has fought a lot of his big fights in the other guy's country, we don't view him as Goliath. Especially when we know right now that he's fighting physically bigger men in the heavyweight division, right? All of these pre-fight photos of Fury looking down on Usyk has the rest of us looking at Usyk, an undisputed cruiserweight champion who is an Olympic gold medal winner. 
has all of us looking at him as if, you know, he's the little guy, right? The unbeaten guy it has been viewed up until now as the underdog. Well, now he's the favorite. I'm telling you that changes everything because boxing is an expectation game. Now, at least the people betting on the event believe by a margin, understand, 60-40 is a 20% difference, right? By a margin. They believe that Usyk is the better fighter. Understand, they're going by a different margin than the judges went by. Right? Tyson Fury has lost the benefit of the doubt. He's now viewed like the underdog. So it's going to be hard to beat Usyk here. Right? Usyk isn't viewed like Gretzky was viewed at the end of his hockey career. Right? He's not viewed like Tyson was viewed before the Buster Douglas fight. Right? He's not viewed like these greats, Michael Jordan, toward the end of his career when other guys started winning MVP. Right? He's viewed as a fresh favorite. A historical figure. In other words, you're going to have to knock him off the mantle to beat him. Just like in baseball, where a tie goes to the runner. A tie here is going to go to the favorite. He's not yet that stale favorite, which Canelo seems to be these days. Right? People still want Usyk to win. They're not yet tired of him. So let's talk about Usyk. Usyk is that rare champion. And this is rare, particularly in a sport like boxing, where people are trying to sell tickets to fights, where there's pressure from promoters to show up to events and to sell the fight, right? Usyk is that rare champion who is blunt in interviews and tells you what has happened to him and where he wants to take this. Understand, too, he's in a unique place. You know, fighters want to prove to you that they belong in the big fights. Here you have a guy, here you have a guy who's lived a career of fighting big fights. He hasn't had that many fights, folks, but yet he's fought top names at Cruiser and Heavy. Right? Top names. He's one of the big winners, by the way, of Daniel Dubois beating Philippe Ergovic. Because he hasn't fought Ergovic, but he fought Dubois. And when you beat a guy, and that guy goes on to do great things, the light shines more brightly on you. So understand, just like Floyd Mayweather has benefited greatly from Canelo's big wins, Right? And keep in mind, Floyd never fought at middleweight or super middleweight or light heavyweight like Canelo did. But we know Floyd beat Canelo. Right? And so when Canelo does something great, you think, oh yeah, you know, who beat Canelo? Floyd's name comes up. Bevel's name comes up. That's good company. Right? Well, just understand, here you have people now doing the math. And they're saying, my goodness, Daniel Dubois has improved a lot. Dubois on his A-game looks like he might be able to beat anyone. Then you realize, that's right, Usyk's already fought him. Just like Usyk's already fought AJ twice. Now Usyk's already fought Tyson Fury. Right, so this is that legit champ. Where even his critics have to nod their head and say, well, he did fight a lot of high-quality cruisers <laughs> and high-quality heavyweights. Right? But understand, Usyk, the guy himself, doesn't have to prove to you that he belongs at this stage. In interviews, 
he's actually more autobiographical. His interviews are among the best in boxing. So, Usyk in an interview said that he feels that Terrence Crawford beats Canelo. Right? Understand, in a recent interview, Usyk claimed that the heavyweight he fought who had the biggest punch, and you heard me name some of the names, right? Dubois, AJ, Fury. The heavyweight Usyk name was Derek Chisora. Now that's very important for this video, right? Usyk feels that Derek Chisora is the heavyweight who hit him the hardest, right? Well, let me just point out here, and we're going to make a couple of pivots here, right? It's my belief that smaller men give Usyk more trouble than larger men. Right? By smaller, it's a relative thing. I'm talking about Derek Chisora gives Usyk a harder time than Tyson Fury. Right now, Fury fought Chisora several times, too many times, quite frankly. Right? Fury beat Chisora handily, especially the last time. Right? But just to understand, boxing is a rock-paper-scissors sport. For Usyk, he feels that Chisora hits harder than Fury, at least hit him harder. Right? I'm just telling you that if you look at the fights, while Usyk had to come back in both fights, the Fury fight and the Chisora fight, folks need to realize that Chisora is the one who is forcing Usyk onto his back foot far more than Tyson Fury. Fury at his best against Usyk is outboxing him. Chisora is actually stalking him. Look at the films. Right? I believe that Usyk has an advantage against less coordinated, clunkier big men who he can move out of the way of than he does smaller, more agile men. Right? The Usyk story is incomplete unless you look at the Chisora fight. Right? Let me just say, too, Usyk is lucky Chisora going into that fight. You know, had a reputation for fading in later rounds. Chisora, after all, is older now. Right? So fighters like Joe Parker, who Chisora dropped in that first fight, let's remember that, early, Joe Parker was able to come back. I'm just telling you that Usyk did not have a big margin for error in coming back against Derek Chisora. I believe Usyk himself knows this. That's why he's praising. That's why as he remembers the Chisora fight, he points out that Chisora was the hardest punching heavyweight he's faced. The second point is that I believe Martin Bacoli, right? I believe he clubbed Usyk around in sparring. Let's be clear here. Usyk is a slow starter, and that's by design, right? You look at Mayweather. You look at Bernard Hopkins. I'm talking about fighters I consider to be great. And they would give away the first two rounds. Right? You'd be looking at them and they'd be looking at their opponent figuring out the lay of the land because they knew these are the safe crackers of the sport. They knew once they got the guy's combination, they could open the safe, take the loot, <laughs> close the safe, leave the home with the bounty, win the fight, going away. Right? That's what Usyk does. That's why... The rematch against Fury is almost unbettable. Right? I don't know, as I sit here, whether Usyk has cracked the safe. 
right? If that fight starts in the 13th round, after Usyk, of course, dominates the later part of the fight, later part of the first fight, if the rematch starts in the 13th round, Fury's in trouble, right? If they reset, and if a replenished Fury, and I thought he was dehydrated for the first fight, if a replenished Fury with the extra weight, and I thought he was clearly winning, I know <laughs> many people here online disagree with me, and by the many people, I'm talking about my own subscribers, right? Read the comments. I thought Fury's up by at least two rounds at the end of the six. At least two rounds. If Fury was dehydrated and comes in and now he knows, hey, I just need to get back to the early rounds and I need to make sure I don't make the mistakes to get hit with a big left hand in the middle of the fight. Right? Round seven, I believe, or some round like that. Um, if Fury was dehydrated and has his own solution to the Usyk problem. That rematch is going to be a firefight. But if Usyk has cracked the safe, and let me point out that the film's disturbing because Usyk's overly reliant on a straight left, then that second fight might be a victory lap. Right? Well, just understand Bacoli, in a sparring session, because Bacoli's 0 to 60, right? He's like a Tesla. Because he throws volume with both hands and flushes fighters like Usyk, who want to hang around the pocket, set up the angle for straight lefts, right? I'm not surprised to hear that Bacoli felt that he dominated his sparring sessions with Alexander Usyk. More importantly, I believe Usyk, who's a student of the game, understands what we've been talking about here. Not because we've been talking about it here, but because it's the reality. This heavyweight division, with all respect to Lennox Lewis, I know Lewis is pubbing the heavyweights when he was back in the day, right? Shannon Briggs, the guy he feels is the hardest puncher he fought. Uh, Klitschko, uh, Vitali, uh, Holifield. Right? A diminished Mike Tyson. Let's face it, the Tyson that was Tyson is 80s Tyson. Right? The Tyson in the 90s starts up here and slowly slides through the decade. Right? In my opinion, this heavyweight division is the deepest division I've seen. Right? Deepest heavyweight division I've seen. I believe Usyk knows privately the Derek Chisoras of the world give him problems. The Martin Bacolis of the world give him problems. I believe he's a guy who isn't caught up on, you know, age and stuff like that. Reputations. I think he's a guy who's in his boxing styles. And I think if he looks down the list of heavyweights, he understands that not only is he not going to be able to stay undisputed much longer, the IBF's going to strip him, right? But he doesn't want to fight several of these heavyweights. I've been talking about Michael Hunter. Folks, in my favorites folder, I've posted the video of Hunter against Usyk. Right now, understand, Hunter... Smaller heavyweight. Hunter himself says the Bridger weight division would actually be his real division. Let me point out, by the way, that Deontay Wilder for his fight against Zhili Zhang came in at Bridger weight. Right? I believe you're going to have a lot of heavyweights. A lot of heavyweights. Who are going to qualify for the Bridger weight division. That's the way it's been historically. Let me tell you what happened. We saw Lennox Lewis, the winner of the 88 Olympic Games. We saw Lennox Lewis and could not believe how big he was back in the late 80s. Then, of course, you had the Klitschko brothers. That opened the door where 
all these bigger dudes who before would say, hey, let me play some basketball, they then ended up in boxing rings. Right, folks, I'm just telling you the history of the sport of boxing has many champions in the 200 to 224 range. Many. This is an unusual era where you hear Ajili Jang is coming in and the, you know, 270s, 280s, you know, Martin Bacoli's up around 280, 290, and you don't blink an eyelash. Right, Gerald Miller, another guy, he's up, you know, above 270. Right, folks, that's, that's new. Right, the Primo Carneras of the world back in the day, the Jess Willards of the world back in the day were aberrations. Right, they were aberrations. You have several great light heavyweights, Billy Kahn, Archie Moore, Bob Foster, right, actually challenged for the heavyweight title. Bob Foster, Hall of Famer, fought both Fraser and Ali. There was a time when a light heavyweight champion against a heavyweight champion was viewed as a competitive match. Right, understand, <laughs> Bob Fitzsimmons, right, jumps up, wins the heavyweight title. I believe Fitzsimmons, middleweight champion, heavyweight champion, light heavyweight champion, right, Roy Jones jumps up, Michael Spinks jumps up. Right, these days, understand, a cruiser jumping up is viewed as a big jump. Deontay Wilder was outweighed by more than 65 pounds in his fight against Zhili Zhang. So, let me just say this. I believe Usyk's a boxing historian, just listening to him in interviews, just seeing how he carries himself. I was once watching, and I believe it's a fight hype interview. They're interviewing Lennox Lewis. And Usyk happens to walk by and crashes the interview because you got the feeling that Usyk was a fan of Lennox Lewis's, right? This is above and beyond the guy actually being a superstar boxer himself, right? This was before he becomes, you know, the first guy since Lewis to be undisputed. So I believe this guy senses his mortality at heavyweight. He knows this is a moment in time, right? His heavyweight career from this point, above and beyond the fight against Tyson Fury in the rematch, might not last another fight. Maybe he doubles back. Let's say Daniel Dubois beats AJ. Maybe he doubles back and says, okay, look, you know, Clowns like the wire feel I was knocked down off a body punch. Let me fight this guy again. There's enough smoke here where I can help my legacy by fighting him again. Plus, I know I can beat him because I have beat him. Right? I can see Usyk having one heavyweight fight after his rematch against Fury if he beats Fury in the rematch. But then I think things get interesting. I believe Usyk has one foot out the door of the heavyweight division. What's surprising to me, and this might just be a champion's personal journey, right? It, it might just be some yard post, some standard that Usyk has for himself, right? Just to understand, Usyk wants to go back down to cruiserweight to fight. Let me just tell you, one of the recipes for disaster that older fighters have, Chris Bird, I'm sure, knows this, is when the older fighter convinces himself that he can lose weight, right, become a vegetarian or whatever, lose weight to fight in a division where he used to fight in the past as he's older, right? I personally view it as a mistake, but I believe this guy, Usyk, is actually going to pursue it. Understand, as he pursues a return to Cruiser, he might make some stops at Bridgerweight. So, who can do a better aggressive front foot job than Derek Chisora?
who we know gave Usyk problems to the point where Usyk feels he hits harder than the other heavyweights he's fought. Let's talk about a Bridger weight who lost to Lawrence Okole. And I know this is going to sound crazy. You'll never get better value as a gambler than when a guy has just lost. And those are some of the best fights to bet on. Right? You know the guy. You know the guy's talent level. The guy came out, got caught, laid an egg, had the wrong strategy. Right? Walked into the wrong punch. Got stopped. Uh, and the public abandons him. The public's fickle. Right? I have no problem, as I've said here many times, being the person in line picking the fighter or the team who's disfavored by the public. Right? Lucas Rosansky just got blown out. Blown out by Lawrence Okole. Was not a competitive fight. I'm not sure if Okole got hit once in the head in that fight. Right? Folks, the flaws make the diamond. Rosansky is not defensively blessed. That could lull an opponent like an Usyk into trying to start fast, which is not Usyk's game and to try to trade with Rosansky who would welcome the firefight. Know the guys in the sport who can operate when the bullets start flying. Rosansky is a KO puncher who in my opinion is more sudden than Derek Chisora. I don't see a Rosansky versus Usyk fight going the distance. It would be unstructured, which would not favor Usyk. It would be action-packed, and it would be filled with danger for Usyk. Right, folks? That's a dangerous fight for Usyk. Let's go further. Another boogeyman for Usyk outside of the heavyweight division is Jay Opataya. Opataya is a fellow southpaw and is likely the best at cruiserweight today. I personally was shocked. I lost on this fight. Well, the hedge held, but I, I was shocked by his rematch with Maris Breedis. Even though it was a rematch, I was expecting Breedis to win the fight, just to be as blunt as possible. Even though it was a rematch, Breedis could not read Opatia's feints. It was shocking. Right? Breedis looked old in the fight. Opatia is what we call twitchy. He's also younger, fresher, and as coordinated as Usyk. That's a dangerous fight for Usyk. If Usyk's serious about going back down to cruiserweight, circle that fight. Quite frankly, if I were advising Opataya, I would tell him, player, what are we doing wasting time in a cruiserweight division? Let's fight Usyk. Let's challenge them. If they offer us less than market value, let's take it. Because you beat this guy or you just look good against this guy. And we'll get paid to fight after this one. Another boogeyman for Usyk would be the winner of the Baturbiev versus Bevo fight. Both guys. Baturbiev and Usyk have history. Understand, unlike Tyson Fury, Baturbiev was able to force Usyk onto his back foot. Right, Baturbiev is a guy who goes around saying that he believes Usyk is weak to the body. Right, folks, these guys had highly competitive amateur fights, plural. Right, understand, Baturbiev, of course, not only is unbeaten himself as a professional, 
Folks, he has never had a professional fight go the distance. If he beats Bevel, right? And I understand it's 175. You know, it's my belief that you don't have to gain the weight to fight a cruiser at 200. Right? If you're fighting a cruiser, all that means is you're eligible to fight a cruiser. If I'm at 175 and, okay, if my next fight's a cruiser, I can have dessert. Okay, all right, I don't want too much dessert. I would come in at 185. Right? Roy Jones wasn't a heavyweight when he fought John Ruiz. Right? Roy Jones would be today a cruiserweight. Another guy who would give Usyk problems is Beevil. Understand, this is a match made in heaven. Beevil is defensively blessed. As hard as it is to hit Usyk, and it's hard, right? Usyk not staggered, not staggered by AJ the entire first fight. In the second fight, he gets caught with a shot. I think it's like the ninth round. The crowd stands up. The public loves Anthony Joshua. The crowd stood up. We get to the 10th round. Usyk's back in the saddle. Right? He fights Tyson Fury. Is not staggered the entire fight. Right? Just understand. Bevel is that rare opponent who's defensively blessed, like Usyk, right? Bevel is that rare opponent who we know can match Usyk in stamina. Bevel, again, just like Paterbiev, in my opinion, would not have to gain weight to fight Usyk, right? Understand, that would be a highly technical boxing match. Usyk is smart enough to know that he can't enter the ring thinking, I'm the bigger man, let me stalk Dimitri Bevel. Because when you're fighting a defensively blessed guy, stalking him plays into his game. Right? I think Bevel's a tough matchup for Usyk. Let's talk about another boogeyman. He has a fight that's coming up you need to know about. He's fighting Chris Billum Smith. The guy I'm talking about is Richard Reakpour. Understand, this is an athlete with ring coverage. If you're going to fight an Usyk, you need ring coverage. You need to be two-handed. Usyk, master counterpuncher, one of the benefits of ring coverage is you're farther away from the guy. You're harder to counter. If you can throw a punch, and if you're an athlete who knows how to roll with the punch or lean away from the punch. In other words, I throw a punch, I see you starting to counter me, I'm farther away from you than most because I have ring coverage. I can throw power shots long distances, and I see you starting to throw on me and I'm twitchy. I'm an athlete. I can lean away from the counter. That's Richard Reactpour. Let me point out, too, there is no, and this needs to be said for Bevel, let me say it for Reactpour. There is no coordination gap between Reactpour and Alexander Usyk. Right now, Reactpour isn't the boxer Usyk is. He's not as good in transition. A lot happens between punches, and Usyk is a master at knowing where to move, knowing how to not get clinched, um, you know, being in position for certain punches. Uh, by the way, that's where Zhili Zhang excels, right? He's not a volume guy, but Zhili Zhang puts himself in position where that right hand is ready, right? You make the mistake he thinks you're going to make, that right hand's already coiled. Well, let me just say, Reactpour is not as good in transition as Usyk, but he's a puncher. And he's more aware of crowd dynamics than, let's say, a Daniel Dubois. Right? This isn't the guy who's going to be in the ring letting round by round slip by. 
This is the guy who understands he's the puncher. And even though Usyk's the better boxer, this is the guy who's going to try to land that big shot every few rounds to remind the crowd that he's in the fight. Finally, there is Gilberto Ramirez. Now, this is a, a guy I like because he's advanced. Right? What do I mean by that? He's one of the premier body punchers in the sport, and it's surprising because he's a tall guy. In other words, you look at a Canelo, who's one of the premier bo body punchers in the sport, and Canelo can get underneath guys, right? We all understand the Mike Tyson, the Canelo, the Roberto Duran type guy who can get underneath you and riddle your body. This is the tall guy who somehow is able to get to your body. Folks, it's one of the better punch stat printouts in recent years. He fought Bevel. Now, granted, the guys had history. They sparred together, right? They're actually buddies. Folks, look at the body punches landed on Bevel by Gilberto Ramirez, according to CompuBox, right? Folks, it's, it's ridiculous. Right, this is the consummate body puncher. Usyk's body is the kind of body that has perturbia of thinking he's weak to the body. Let me also point out, too, that Gilberto Ramirez is conceptual. Right, I want folks to think about the great Ezra Charles. Right? Um... Ramirez, in his fight against Gulamarian, a fighter who many here online, my subscribers, thought was the harder-hitting, better athlete than Ramirez. Many people were expecting an upset in that fight. Ramirez, again, a tall southpaw, right? Southpaw like Usyk. Ramirez kept his head. <laughs> it's, really, it's, it's shocking. Kept his head close to Gulamarian's chest. He figured out that Gulamarian's power didn't translate to the area right above his chest. So believe it or not, Gilberto Ramirez does something that's unusual for him. Right? This is the guy making adjustments. He has his head in a place that he normally doesn't. And this is a guy with an excellent jab. Gulamarian did not know what to do. Gilberto Ramirez has shown up at cruiserweight, and he's already the title holder. Understand, if Usyk wants to unify at cruiser, this is one of the guys he's going to have to go through, unless Ramirez jumps to bridgerweight, where he would be one of the elite bridgerweights. Right? I think this guy would give... Usyk, who's faster handed? Who's the better athlete? A big fight at Cruiser. Right? So let me just point out that Usyk is a guy with the money in his bank account. Right? Made a mint against Fury. Of course, made a mint in two fights against Joshua. Right? I'm sure he made a mint against Dubois. And that's after an undisputed cruiserweight run where he won the Muhammad Ali Trophy at Cruiser. So this is a guy who shouldn't have financial concerns. Right? He's not a guy who feels that he needs to be the heavyweight champion. That's not his calling. This is that artistic guy who feels that he's been there, he's done that, Undisputed at heavy, I've done that, right? He's challenging himself. He wants to go back down to Cruiser. I'm not sure if he makes it. He wants to go back down to Cruiser to try to once again become undisputed at Cruiser. Right, folks? The water at Cruiser is going to be dangerous for him. This is a new set of guys. Right, Jay Obataya is a young gun. He doesn't care who was the undisputed cruiserweight champion. 
uh, back in the day when they had uh, the World Series of Boxing. He doesn't care about that, right? Let's just say folks need to realize that the cruisers might be more dangerous for an Alexander Usyk than fighting big clunky heavyweights. Right? Food for thought. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this now 40-minute YouTube video. Thanks for indulging me. Thanks for stopping by.